Welcome to third lecture in data mining then. Uh, and the third lecture is at least we are planning it a little bit more interactive. So the idea was for you to watch some videos about SVMs so that now we can start discussing that. Uh, have you watched those? Yes. Okay, we have one, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I watched the first one. Yeah, me too. Okay, one and a half. Uh, me too was the first one or both? Yeah, f first one. Okay, two out of three, not, not bad. Uh, okay, so what, what did you think about those? For, for me, from right. Henrik here, I would like to have some kind of uh, background if you could describe why these vector support machines are so important and 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 uh, how to use them uh, of course he described that in, in the lecture but uh, uh, it was we jumped into to uh, a course where they had have several uh, lectures before i think yes but well we have also had several lectures before they of course yeah yeah more. Uh, but, but at least for me maybe i didn't understand all everything you 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 described in the previous lectures but but could you please give some kind of a, a little bit overview uh, or introduction to this mm -hmm. so if you if we start thinking about what what kind of problem uh, svm is trying to solve uh, what how would you describe the goal of SVMs? Uh, to classify the, the data set. Mm -hmm. So <clears> if you compare SVMs to, for example, decision trees, as, as we have talked about decision trees uh, on the previous lecture. Uh, yeah. The same problem? Is it solving different problem? Yeah. Mm -hmm. seems to me that the SVMs, uh, there you had some kind of um, workflow to uh, make this more automatic than the decision trees. Is that correct? Like uh, to, to be able to program that uh, for a computer to do. So if you if you go into details of how this is actually implemented, then in a sense you are right. It, it consists of more different steps than a, than a decision tree. Uh, but if you think about what this is used for, so assuming that there is somebody has already done the work, so there is a uh, either a library or a program with graphical user interface or service on the web, however you want to uh, organize it, which uh, implements all of this thing. So from the perspective of, of the user, it doesn't really make big difference, right? The, the goal, okay. you still want to solve exactly the same challenge. You have some data. Let, let's talk for simplicity about the binary case where the decision is yes or no. So you want to separate, uh, be it, patients into those who should be discharged and those who should be kept in the hospital or be it some kind of machines into those that will fail and those which will not fail anytime soon and so on. Mm -hmm. The way of making this, this separation is different. Uh, it's, it's quite a bit more complicated than a decision tree, but it's important to understand that the goal Hello, Malu, can you hear us? We cannot really hear. Yeah, I, Henry can hear you, but uh, maybe something has to be muted here. Is it better now, Slavomir? Um, no, I think, it, I think it's fine. Yeah. So it's... yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the, 
if, if we keep keep going. So the goal of SVMs is the same as with decision trees. You want to be making decisions, right? So you want to, based on some historical data, where you have some examples of uh, those decisions, you want to build a model and then you can use this model in order to make decisions about new data, uh, where you don't know what the decision should be. Everybody yeah. agrees with that? Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. One thing also that I stumbled on is that uh, uh, the mathematics knowledge I, I have pr from <clears throat> from the university uh, is not very up to date. And uh, for example, the Lagrange multipliers, uh, I'm not, uh, <laughs> I don't remember fully. Can you say something about how the Lagrange multipliers came into these equations? So. We, we can go back go back to that later. I, I think it's yeah. important to, to understand that, uh, of course, if you would want to follow every single step of the lecture, you need to kind of pressure up uh, on this kind of knowledge. At the same time, it's not really necessary, right? It's, no, okay. If you, if you know that the whole point of this exercise is to solve the optimization problem, actually, find the minimum of this function. Uh, of course, it would be nice to really understand how this is done in an efficient way. But to be honest, there is well too much knowledge. We, don't, we cannot know everything. right? So if you don't yeah. understand the, the exact details of how this is done, that doesn't really matter because, as, as uh, the, the professor said, uh, there are libraries that will do it for you. So if you just want to use those techniques, you don't need to understand every single step. And if okay. you have a rough idea of what Lagrange is, that's, that's perfectly enough. And to be honest, many people who use SVMs have no idea that something like Lagrange exists. And it's also fine because uh, again, there will be library that, that solves this optimization problem for them. Uh, we, we can go a little bit into, into those, those uh, things as, as, we go, uh, as we go through. Uh, we, we will talk a little bit about the, the mathematical formulation because uh, it has some nice, nice properties. Uh, again, compared to something like decision trees. Right? If, if you think about this, there was basically no math in the uh, lecture about decision trees. There was one equation for uh, for entropy, which was kind of trivial. And then, if you tried to do uh, to do the quizzes, then you would encounter a different equation for Gini index, which measures pretty much the same thing slightly differently. But the whole idea behind decision trees was very intuitive one. It wasn't really mathematical. Okay? The SVMs give you a different perspective because here the very intuitive problem of making decisions is actually phrased in a very concrete kind of hardcore math problem. And then you solve the math problem. And then you kind of try to see how this math problem relates to the intuitive problem which you, which you started with. Uh, and in a sense, the, the lecture, uh, as was given, is maybe a little bit too much on the mathematical side. And you can quite clearly see that the, the professor giving this lecture, he, he is very much a kind of from math background. He, uh, he enjoys those kinds of mathematical analysis. Uh, and I think it's, it's do, do, yes. Uh, do you think that this, this uh, mathematical knowledge, is that uh, mostly for people wanting to do really deep research or uh, is there some, I mean, I do know some math, but I, I've, it, I think that it doesn't really help me a lot when I try to do some machine learning in general, when I'm just using it. Mm -hmm. So do you think it's only useful when, when you try to do more deep research or? Or what do you think? No, I, I think it actually is useful when, when you are using those tools as well. Uh, because if you understand the tools better, you will be able to use them better. And that there is always a way of doing machine learning, which is you get some data, try 20 different methods with 5,000 parameter settings each, and you will get some kind of results. Uh, but this is not the best way of doing uh, data mining machine learning. 
much better way is to actually understand the problem, see how it relates to the tools that we are using, and be able to, in some kind of uh, principled way, figure out a good tool for this particular task. Uh, it's not always obvious, but I think having at least some level of understanding is, is definitely useful, even if you are not going to be creating new methods. Okay, yeah. Uh, there's one thing I was thinking about with the SVMs. Uh, in many of, maybe I just didn't see it in the lectures, but in many of the um, uh, examples, they showed uh, perfectly separable uh, data sets. So I was wondering how how it performs when you can separate uh, all the points with a perfect uh, with some line. Mm -hmm. So this is what he talks about in the second lecture. So, so you still okay, have fair something enough. to wait for. Uh, but yes, basically yeah, okay. that, that, that's that's kind of the the, the way. The, this was organized. The, the first lecture was about the, the basic case. Given that we have uh, data which is separable, in, in the last couple of minutes he actually talked about the nonlinear transformation as well. But even then, the data was supposed to be separable. They assumed kind of no noise. Uh, but that was the, uh, well, more optimistic version of, of it. So the, the se in the second lecture, he talked uh, about what to do if you have some noisy points and, and how, to, uh, how, this, how this changes. Mm -hmm. So if we, if we compare... I mean, oh, go ahead. Yes, uh, he said that this, I think that the name was kernel function, could, could of course be, be defined in different way. And he talked about some kind of catalog where you can find already defined kernel functions and then if you you need to define your own that you can't find in the catalog you had to do some mathematics research to to uh, investigate if that was valid or not and uh, i he heard him but i must admit i did not really understand how to do that kind of investigation is that something you think is needed for us to, to apply this or should we could we ask come a very long way just by applying kernel function from the catalog. I think you don't need to worry about defining your own kernel functions. I, I think uh, it's very unlikely that you will ever encounter a case where you would need a specialized kernel. Uh, and if, if you are in such situation, then, then you will need to find, to find somebody who, who understands this anyway. So yeah. that there is so many kernels available that it's very unlikely that you will, you will encounter this problem. Where can, my, where can we find this catalog of, of uh, uh, investigated kernels? <laughs> Interesting question. I guess if you Google uh, kernel function list, if you Google for a list of kernel functions, uh, there will be yeah. some mix up with like Linux kernel and so on, uh, but yeah. like at least a couple of links here will will have a number of those. Maybe you can send that link out after after the lecture today. Yeah, sure, I can I can do that. Yeah, yeah. does it say there in that that table also uh, some kind of advice for, for what kind of situations a kernel is? Good to use, or is it just fail and error, or how, how to to uh, use that catalog? That's uh, less clear. I, I think uh, so. The, the one that I have found here doesn't doesn't tell you what is what what different kernels are good for. They they just describe the kernels. Yeah, but but, but for me that's new to machine learning. How, how to start? <laughs> mm. This is tricky. I, I think that this will mostly come with experience. It's, it's difficult to give some kind of rules of thumb. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, uh, as, as usual, the, the starting point would be to start with the simplest kernels and go towards more complicated ones. That's, that's probably a way of, uh, of looking at it. Mm -hmm. When you say complicated, that, that that's the mathematical definition of the kernel, then. Uh, it it yeah. can be less or, 
or more complicated, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you can think of it also in terms of computational complexity. So uh, the, the more complicated kernel will take longer time to compute. But in general, this is related to, I mean, it's, it's also related to what we talked about before, the complexity of the hypothesis space. That the, mm -hmm. the more complicated hypothesis you allow, the, the more likely you are to overfit. You can think about the, the complexity of the kernels kind of like the, the size of the decision tree, to some degree. Mm -hmm. Limit yourself to small decision trees, you will not overfit so much. If you limit yourself to simpler kernels, you will not overfit so much. So, so one example mm -hmm. is linear kernel or polynomial kernel, kernels of different uh, degrees. The higher the degree, the more complicated it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can look at it as a feature space. I mean, the more um, more complicated a kernel you have, the, the more features you have, which could uh, allow you to create, for example, a, a linear decision boundary. So you, mm -hmm. the, so, so the question kind of can, can boil down to: I mean, do you know what features are good for solving your particular classification problem? I mean, you, mm -hmm. the kernel is supposed to help that. I mean, generate those features that are useful for um, you know, separating the two classes. Mm -hmm. So if, if we try to compare SVMs with decision trees, as we said, but they are trying to solve pretty much the same problem. Um, what do you think are the strong and weak points of something like SVM versus decision tree. Uh, I'd say um, that the decision trees have uh, an easy time to deal with the uh, factor variables because you can just create features yes and no on them and uh, I guess uh, the SVM would have a little harder time. Mm. I'm not sure I understand what, what kind of variables you mean. Uh, like uh, binary variables. Yes or no, or something like that. Yeah, well, yes, yes or no, that's just zero or one, right? So I'm not sure if this yeah, is maybe a it's the same for, for SVMs. Hey. So I have a question. You're welcome. Uh, so, yeah. no, I think both both of those can handle different kinds of, of attributes. Uh, if you have something like categorical attributes, where, where you don't really have the ordering of values, red, green, yellow, uh, those would be slightly easier for decision trees than for uh, for SVMs because it's it's difficult to put them in space, right, in metric space. Uh, and for decision tree, yeah. you can have, uh, you, you can just split on all the possible values. So, so yeah. That's, but there are techniques for, for doing, dealing with that. So, so it's not really a big difference. Mm -hmm. Any other ideas? Which, which one is computationally easier? Which one is able to handle bigger data sets? As I understood, it's uh, SVMs because there was a lot of simplifications in the math there. Is that correct? There was a lot of simplifications in the math. The, they solved the problem or they phrased the problem in a way which is reasonably easy to solve. On the other hand, the idea behind SVMs is to solve the optimization problem in an exact fashion. And so we actually are trying to find an optimal solution. The algorithm for learning decision trees, that's a greedy algorithm. So it's not trying to find the optimal tree. It's just uh, making decisions, whatever looks best at a particular stage. But, but, but 
Uh, then I, when you say it like this, then I don't understand um, what we said before because I, I had the the, the idea. Uh, of course, it was wrong, but but that, that it was more automatic in some way in the SEMs. But but isn't it that then that you you get an optimal solution in the SEMs and that that is mathematically built in in the method, and and that's not in the decision trees or. Yes. Maybe I'm wrong. The solution you are getting from the decision tree learning algorithm is not optimal. Uh, but both both methods are fully automatic in a sense that I see. Okay. You 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 get a data set and then you mm -hmm. give the data set to a computer and it will calculate the the actual model. So that there is no of course when, when you present it on a whiteboard, uh, then you do it in steps, but the actual method in practice, both in both cases, it's fully automatic. There is no yeah, yeah. that the, the user needs to make. Uh, but is it so that you can handle more complex uh, problems with, with the SVM since uh, you move to this? Uh, infinite dimensional space and back or so but it kind of depends on what you mean but by, by, by can you handle more complex problems uh, yeah it definitely, it handles different kinds of problems. Because if, so one way of looking at it is, if you think of a data set with, I don't know, one million examples, and I mean, uh, yeah. the lecture said that 10,000 is, is easy, 100,000 might be a problem, million might be too, too hard to solve. I guess it's probably somewhat outdated now, I guess the, the lecture is probably from, let's see if I see, it might be five or six years old. So I guess by now the progress might have been so that we can handle an extra order of magnitude. But if we go to something like 10 million examples or so, it probably would, would still be a problem. Uh, because you are actually trying to solve this quadratic uh, equation or optimization problem, uh, and you are trying to solve it in a optimal way taking all the examples into account and if you if you think of how the decision tree was operating uh, you would you would iterate over all the attributes and then you just need to calculate this quite simple metric like the entropy for this single mm. attribute across all the uh, across all the examples of course but if you have a million mm -hmm. millions examples, uh, it's basically just summing up one or zero over all of those examples. That, that's an easy operation. Right? That, that there is not, mm. nothing particularly complex there. Mm. Of course, you need to do it several times because you need to do it over all the attributes, and then you need to do it for every uh, for every level in your tree. But mm. This only consists of, of quite simple operations. Uh, so you can actually learn decision trees from, from quite a bit bigger data sets than what, what SVM is capable of handling. Uh, on the other hand, the, the actual, the, one of the problems with decision trees is that they are actually quite susceptible to overfitting because of uh, this kind of greedy fashion. You, you will start in the root of your tree with the attribute that seems to be best overall, but it doesn't really have to be the best one. And if you make a bad decision at the top, then the rest of your tree will also uh, they will kind of propagate this error to make it harder to create the rest of the tree. Uh, 
So especially for, for complex problems, the decision trees are more likely to, to overfit, while the SVM, because of this uh, kind of optimal way of solving the optimization problem, is more likely to find the, uh, well, the decision boundary with which has fatter margin so that it lies farther away from all the points, which means it is less likely to overfit. Mm -hmm. But can you explain? Uh, in the la last lecture, he, he he said a lot about this. I think it was called this penalty term or factor, this mm -hmm. C. Mm -hmm. And uh, he discussed that, uh, and uh, you can set that value to uh, avoid uh, overfitting. Uh, but how to compare that to, to uh, the problem of, of avoid overfitting in decision trees? Because in SEMs, there were actually a method, as I understood that. Mm -hmm. Yes, so in decision trees, there are also some methods. We haven't really talked about this, uh, but there are different methods to avoid overfitting in decision trees. And the most common one is pruning of decision trees, which is basically saying that you build a decision tree and then you cut the lowest levels based on things like how many examples you have had to train that and so on. Uh, this is one, one example of uh, of something similar to the C parameter for... Could you, repeat, could you repeat that about pruning? I did not get that fully, please. So the, the main reason why decision trees would overfit is that as you are going lower and lower, lower in the levels, you have less examples from which you are left. Right? Because if you have your data with, let's say, three attributes, and you make a split on one of those, you end up with two subtrees. Each of those subtrees will only have a subset of examples. It doesn't have to be exactly mm -hmm. half, it will probably be somewhat close to half. Uh, and that means that on the second level of the tree, you will have one more split. So then in each of the nodes, you will end up with a quarter of examples. So every subsequent node you are creating is based on smaller number of examples, which means it's more likely that it's actually not a correct node, but it's based on the kind of noise in the data or just some kind of random factors, uh, not the underlying true function. So one way of avoiding overfitting it in decision trees is to make sure that you don't create additional nodes when you don't have enough examples to really make good decisions about what what those nodes should be or how those nodes should look like uh, and that's that's called pruning so you create the mm -hmm. food and then you remove the nodes at the bottom which are basically not really trustworthy mm. And in a sense, that this fills a very similar role as, as the C parameter. So for those who mm -hmm. didn't watch the second video, uh, how, how much did you watch? Nothing at all? Not good. Uh, so we are down to two out of four. Uh, so basically, the second lecture is, among other things, about soft margin classifier. So the idea is that you also you allow some number of points to be within the margin. So basically, you consider them noise, uh, you penalize the optimization problem for the occurrence, but you don't really require uh, a decision boundary which is exactly which correctly classifies all the points. And if you think about it, this is similar to what would happen with a decision tree because. If you have a decision tree and you create some kind of node which is almost pure except for one example, so let's say it's all from class A, but there is just one example from class B, what you can do is you can keep splitting, keep adding extra nodes to the decision tree 
until you have a perfect uh, separation, but it's most likely not really worth it. We only have one example. It's much more reasonable to assume that one example is noise, rather than try to create, figure out what attribute is a good way of splitting from the rest uh, of the node. So this is exactly what the C parameter tries to achieve, and we could achieve similar things in, in decision trees with, for example, just this pruning the bank. But if, if we take maybe one, yes, go ahead. Yeah, why have you chosen uh, uh, SVMs and decision trees? Are they the most common or the most easy to understand? Or, or, or because I think there are even more methods. Or oh yes, there there, there is a lot of different methods. But if you look yeah. at what what methods are are actually successful, uh, I think the the three most common ones is decision trees, SVMs, and neural networks. So I will also talk about neural networks a little bit today. Yeah. I think, uh, well, today, I think the neural networks beat everything else in terms of popularity, uh, just on the, on the basis of uh, deep learning. I mean, this is, this is the, the biggest current high. But if, mm -hmm. if you look at the, the lecture there, uh, this lecture is from, at least partially, from before the hype about neural networks or the mm -hmm. learning. So the big hype in machine learning before deep learning was actually about SVMs. The one before mm -hmm. was about ensemble learning. So things like random forest. A lot of this was, was centered about decision trees. Uh, so, so I actually wanted you to see the, the things that at various times in the past have been considered the holy grails of, of machine learning. Uh, and in a sense, as you can see, they are becoming more and more complicated because SVMs is significantly more complicated than decision trees. Neural networks and especially deep learning is even more complicated than that. Uh, so those, those solutions are not getting any easier. Uh, but the, the main reason for starting with decision trees was just how intuitive they are. Is that mm. the, the concept of decision trees is just very natural for, for people. It captures how we are thinking about. The reason for SVMs is that I wanted to show this nice uh, computational properties or this nice mathematical formulation to, to show that you can actually phrase the machine learning task as a clear cut, very precisely defined mathematical problem. Uh, you can solve it and you can use this, this solution to classify new data. Uh, and then mm -hmm. later today, I will talk about uh, artificial neural networks, uh, which basically you, you cannot really uh, ignore today. You, know, you have to talk about it a, at least a little bit. Uh, but the, those, the, the artificial neural network are, in a sense, an exact opposite of, uh, of SVMs in terms of they have an extremely complicated mathematical formulation. Uh, and from the theoretical point of view, we actually don't really understand very well how they work. Right? They are very much the result of a large number of people trying large number of, of things and at some point kind of stumbling upon a solution that happens to work. But we don't really know why. I think this, this so does it, make it for interesting discussions. But do you mean that even you as mathematicians don't know all the details of, of the neural networks? Uh, well, I wouldn't say that we are really mathematicians. So no, we don't okay. know the, all the details, uh, but there is actually nobody who really knows all the details. But, but how come this method came up from the beginning? Because normally, or the most common case is that some mathematician do some statement and, and investigate something and then it inherits from there. But this was different then. 
I think you have a very optimistic way of thinking about science. <laughs> <laughs> the accidents Maybe. play a much bigger role in, in science than, than your statement would suggest. Uh, but, I mean, in a sense, so there is, of course, at least some level of theory behind the network. It's not like we, we have absolutely no idea how they work. Uh, I think one of the one of the big things about neural networks is just how easy it is to make small modifications to them. Uh, if you think about decision trees, if you would try to come up with a similar but different way of creating decision trees, it's not that easy. And you might come up with two or three different ways, but you couldn't really come up with a thousand different ways. The similar thing with SVMs. The, their whole point is based on such elegant uh, uh, mathematical foundations that there is not that much wiggle room in coming up with different solutions. And I mean, if, if you look at those question and answer sessions, they ask about different uh, distance measures and so on. There are some things that you can, you can play with. You can try different kernels, but the actually amount of uh, flexibility in this general method is not that high. And that's in very extreme contrast to something like artificial neural networks, because in artificial neural networks, you have pretty much an infinite way of, or infinite number of different uh, types of networks that you can try to come up with. You can play with architectures and different uh, functions within neurons and, and so on. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why it has gotten so successful, because People have started taking this general idea and modifying it in different ways. Uh, and because there is so many people doing machine learning, and so many different uh, settings for so many different problems, that this kind of, I, I would call it at least semi-random exploration, has actually worked because people stumbled upon ideas that, that work. Uh, kind of through continuous improvement. Uh, you, you take some solution which worked well for somebody else, turns out there's a thousand different research groups that are trying to improve on it. Even if we don't really understand how it works, some of those research groups will come up with something that actually helps. And then based on this, that there will be some kind of progress. Is there any applications today where you actually use uh, decision trees and uh, SVMs? Yes, there, there is there is a lot of those. Mm -hmm. So, in what kind of uh, problems or practical implementation do you use a decision tree? When do you use an SVM? And when do you use an um, ANN or artificial neural network? So, there is one part of this answer which is which is easy. Uh, there is actually not that many applications where artificial neural network deep learning has been successful. But despite all of this hype, the problem with deep learning is that it requires a lot of data. And here we are not talking about thousands or tens of thousands of examples. Here we need at least millions, if not, if not billions of examples before we can actually do some kind of learning. So, there is a lot of settings in which artificial neural networks are not really that good. Uh, there is a number of ways of cheating this at least a little bit because artificial neural networks are very good at transfer learning. So they are very good at taking a solution to one problem and applying it to a problem which is different but somewhat related. So. The, the big success stories for artificial neural networks is basically image processing and to some degree natural language processing and speech processing. Uh, but they are basically very good at pretty much all kinds of image processing because you can train them on huge image sets uh, or you can pre-train them on huge available image sets that the public ones from internet and, and so on. And then you can just adapt them to your particular problem using a lot less data. Uh, so basically, if you want to be using especially deep learning, that there are 
two ways of, of doing it. One is you either need to have somewhere between millions and billions of examples, or you need to be able to find a tree train network which solves a problem which is somewhat similar to the problem you are trying to solve. Uh, if those things are not fulfilled, then you basically, you would probably use either SBMs or decision trees. And what you would probably do is not like a single decision tree, you would probably do maybe random forest or some other kind of ensemble. But uh, to figure out if what you want to be using is actually decision tree or SVM, uh, that's a trickier question. There are no really good uh, kind of rules of thumb about which of those methods will work better. Mm. I guess the, the biggest, now it's, it's, it's really hard in the abstract to say when decision tree will outperform SVM and, and when SVM will outperform decision tree. Yes, understood. Uh, but but so artificial neural network is more for um, classifying vision and speech. But what, what kind of data do you think is typical for decision decision trees in SVMs? Is more like you you mentioned um, what's it called um, uh, fault fault case fault analysis from data from uh, vehicles or what what kind of Problems are we talking about that you use for uh, where you use SVMs and decision trees? So, mostly what you would use this if, if you have some kind of uh, uh, some kind of let, let's say interesting features already available. So Basically, in, you, you do a lot of uh, machine learning of this kind uh, based on some kind of, or pretty much any kind of da database, databases. Uh, you can do classification, for example, of different customer types based on their purchases. You can figure out what kind of marketing campaign will work for different uh, people based on their uh, socioeconomic profiles. Uh, you can be doing uh, predictions of, uh, or maybe, maybe a regression problem of how, how many plane tickets you will sell at different prices. Uh, you can do classification. It's like uh, Cambridge Analytica with Facebook. Uh, yes. <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I get it. Actually, Facebook is one of those cases where you might end up with enough data to, to use deep learning, so that there is some work on using deep learning for that. But a lot of a lot of analysis in social networks is done using random forest or SVMs. Yeah, so the, the key difference is the uh, amount of data used for, for training, basically. Yes, pretty okay. much. So if, if you think about how how the machine learning field has been changing kind of over the years. Uh, the initial approaches were based on the idea of you have very little data and you really need to extract as kind of you need to squeeze every single bit of information out of this data. Uh, and this is this is kind of what, what the SVMs were designed for. Right? The, the idea here is that you have your data which represents your reality and you are really, your goal is to find this optimum line which separates your classes. Uh, and you are willing to go to quite big lengths to make sure that your line is really the best possible line that you can have. Uh, so in that context, you can think of SVM as a kind of clear evolution from decision trees, which were decision trees were basically based on the idea of let's try to think about how people make decisions. Uh, people make decisions by looking at if-then rules in a kind of hierarchical way, which is what, what led to, to the development of decision 
Uh, but then turns out that we still have a lot of problems like this. That not everywhere we actually have big data, right? especially when we start talking about data which has actually been processed and understood because it's very easy to collect a lot of data uh, but if you collect a lot of data without really putting the effort to figure out what this data should represent then you are collecting a lot of noise and only a little bit of actually useful data so if, if you the, we don't really have necessarily good ways of quantifying it but if you intuitively think about what's the ratio between the useful data and useless data uh, in general the more data you collect the less amount of useful data will be in it right? if you spend the time to actually design your database correctly to actually collect your data in a careful manner then you will be collecting a lot less data because this data collection is orders of magnitude more expensive but you will actually be able to trust this data much more. So there is a trade-off there uh, in between uh, how much you really want to how, how much you want to how much work you want to put up front before you start collecting data in order to make sure that the important things that you are interested in actually end up in this data versus how much you want to put later on in processing the data which was easy and cheap to collect but which was probably collected without too much thought and which might contain some interesting insight but might also end up being almost pure noise so in, in that context i read about yeah sorry continue so, please so so in that context there is a big difference between approaches like SVMs and uh, decision trees, which are designed for data in which you assume that most of the data is actually meaningful. Right? There is some amount of noise, but you assume that uh, the actual useful information outweighs the noise uh, versus those kind of more modern uh, like deep learning techniques, which are focusing a lot on uh, processing data in which most of the data is noise and you just need to find uh, the actual information there. and images are a good example of, of something like this right? if, if you consider image represented as a I don't know, thousand by thousand pixels most of this data is, is noise there is very little actual information uh, in this so the the approaches that you should be using in order to, to get something useful out of it are necessarily quite different. Yes, I understand. Good explanation, thank you. I recently read about an application where, where they used, to, and I think you said to uh, Slavomir about an application where they do predictive maintenance of, of some kind of machine. I think it was an electric engine and then they measured the vibration and could detect when the, some bearing maybe was on the way to, to, to break. What kind of, of algorithm do you think was used in that case? Could, could we estimate or guess something? Mm. Well, so that, that's probably not, not really enough information to make a guess. Uh, I guess so. If I was to make a guess, I would say that the core of the algorithm was probably expert knowledge, uh, because th there are several different ways of of doing it. Right? If if you have vibration sensor, then what you are actually collecting is time series data uh, of the of the vibrations, and if you want to directly analyze this data, it's going to be quite difficult. Uh, just because this is an example of this data which has a lot of noise and very little useful information. Uh, if you would collect enough of this data to, to try something like deep learning, then it would probably be quite successful. But what you would need is you would need uh, probably data from millions of hours on thousands of machines uh, before you could, you could really get good results. So 
in many cases like this, what really happens is that, that there is some expert knowledge that goes into extracting useful features out of those uh, that the row signal. So, for example, that there are obvious cases like instead of just measuring the vibrations, you would do some kind of Fourier transform, or you would do some wavelength analysis, or any other way in which you take the expert knowledge about how you expect a bed bearing or something like this to manifest in this data, and you extract features which capture this kind of information. And then, as a second step, because it, it's difficult to really do it fully manually, right? to, to make sure that you are very precise in extracting those features. But if you find good features, you find rules or uh, equations to roughly extract them from the data, then you can use machine learning on top of that to actually kind of learn the parameters, the thresholds, and uh, how to combine different, of the different features into good decision. Uh, and then it could be pretty much any kind of, any kind of algorithm, but uh, I, I would assume that something like SBM would work quite well. Thank you. Mm, so maybe just to kind of uh, s slowly finish this discussion part because I, I, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, about neural networks still. Uh, but if we if we talk a little bit about this concept of support vectors because this this is quite important in understanding the the whole point of SVMs. Uh, so what what are the support vectors and why they are so so important as to even give the name to the whole method yeah you mean why the support vectors are important or well let's start with what they are so what what is a support yeah, vector? but, but uh, i i understood that uh, the basis for the support vector machines is that uh, you define a minimum uh, tolerance uh, to, to for dividing the different classes and that the support vector machines were, were the length of those were actually from the points nearest to, to the the border and define from the, the point nearest to the border to this plane that divides these uh, data points. Mm -hmm. Yes, so, so the basic idea is that support vectors are the data points which lie closest to the boundary. And right? so those are the ones that actually define the boundary. So in a sense, So if, if those are the points that are closest to the boundary, if they define the boundary, does it mean that other points are useless? If you would remove all the other points and just leave support vectors, uh, would, the, would the learning result in the same? I want to say yes, that it only depends on, the, on all the support vectors. Everybody agrees? I didn't quite hear the question because there was some noise in the background. So the question was if, if you only keep support vectors, if you remove all the other data points from, from the train method, will you get the same, uh, the same learning result or not? And yes, basically that's, that's the if you if you look at some some think about some of the examples that, that was shown during the during the lecture, right, very clearly the, the points that are those insight points, uh, they don't really contribute much or they don't contribute anything to the to the actual decision. Because if they would disappear, the, the line 
would still be exactly the same, the line that, that separates the two data sets. Now, this only holds for the uh, hard margin case. Of course, in the soft margin, when you actually allow for noise, that's not necessarily the case, right? Then, then those internal points can still matter because without them, you could consider the support vectors as noise. Uh, but that's, that, that's a slightly, slightly different issue. Mm -hmm. So the, one of the important features of, of support vector machines is, is that they actually are able of finding those points which are the most important ones for learning. Because if you, again, if you go back to something like uh, decision trees, for decision trees, we don't really have such a, such a concept as vectors. The decision tree is affected by all the points, also the ones which are far away from the decision boundary. Uh, and that's actually not, not necessarily a very good thing, right? Because uh, it's not that useful for, for those, those points which are not close to the, to the other class to actually influence the decisions. Uh, but because the decision tree looks at the data attribute by attribute, it doesn't really look at it in this kind of aggregated way. Uh, the approaches are, are quite different. And then, so, so one last thing that I wanted to, to talk about is uh, why did the, the whole idea start from this concept of uh, linear separability? What, what's the main, uh, main point behind this? Because then, then if we have data which is not linearly separable, and a lot of data usually isn't linearly separable, then we have to be doing this uh, either the kernel trick or we have to do those nonlinear transformations. Why couldn't we just start by a nonlinear separation between data? Any ideas? Uh, maybe to make sure that it also works on uh, linear se separable data. Well, but if you have data which is linearly separable, you can always separate with, with other shapes as well. Right? So let's say we, we could limit ourselves to polynomial separation. So we could say that we want to have data which is Separa separable by a polynomial of degree up to 10. And then linear would be a special case of something like this. So that there are two main reasons for, for starting with uh, with something that is simple like linear separability. Uh, and there is one which is kind of practical slash computational complexity. If we are going to find an optimum for, for minimum for this optimization problem, the simpler the optimization problem, the more likely we are to be able to do it for large data sets. Right? So in case of linear separability, we end up with quadratic programming a problem which is somewhat easy to solve. We can do it for 1,000, 10,000, maybe million examples. If we would be looking for a more complicated decision boundary, the corresponding uh, optimization problem would become even more, even more complicated. 
and then we couldn't be able, we wouldn't be able to efficiently solve this. Uh, so that's one one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is also that, uh, as we have talked before, when you want to be doing machine learning, in order to get good generalization, you want to start with the simplest possible hypothesis. Okay. So the more complicated hypothesis space you use, the more different hypotheses you have in your hypothesis space, the more likely you are to overfit. So what you actually want to do is you want to find the simplest possible hypothesis. So in this particular case, uh, the idea was that, well, linear separation is pretty much the simplest hypothesis we can imagine. So instead of trying to keep the original data and uh, try to build more and more complicated uh, hypothesis space, which will allow us to, to separate this, the SVMs have decided to do it the opposite way, to keep the hypothesis always simple. So you never get a hypothesis which is more complicated than a linear hypothesis and instead do transformations of the data. Uh, and because they have this concept of support vectors, which means that they don't really consider all of the data points, they only consider a hopefully small subset of the data points, uh, the data transformation is less harmful than the hypothesis transformation. Because if you do even very complicated data transformation, you can still end up with a small number of support vectors, in which case you know that your transformation hasn't been very harmful in a sense. Uh, doing this kind of evaluation on a more complicated hypothesis would be a lot, uh, a lot harder. Okay, so I think that's that's pretty much what I wanted to talk about uh, concerning SVMs. Uh, any final questions or uh, discussion points? Because if not, I will I will move to artificial neural networks. You yes. said that. Uh, yes, please do. So I um, I have to go at sixteen thirty. So. Okay. Uh, you said that first we had decision trees, then SVMs, and then neural networks. What do you foresee in five to ten years to be uh, the dominant uh, method? I, I'm not going to make this guess. That that never ends. Well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Those yeah. kind of it, 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 it's hard to say. I mean, uh, that that, mm -hmm. that tells me that it's very hard to say then. Yes, definitely. No, all of those guesses uh, when when people make they they sound just ridiculous after a time. Like, I mean, the, the, there is a world market for maybe five computers, uh, and yeah. you, we are terrible at predicting those things. So I'm not even going. To yeah. Track. Okay. So to to talk about artificial neural networks, basically the whole the kind of core concept here is that. We like to think that our brains are quite uh, smart, so let's try to emulate those things. So basically, can we copy the structure and the way our brains operate and train them to do the kind of problems that, that we want to do? Uh, and there are some challenges. For example, we don't really understand how brain works. We have some ideas. Uh, the core concept of artificial neural networks was actually created in the 50s. Uh, and back then, we understood even less about our, how our brain works. So, so this is a very simplistic model. Our brains are actually quite big. The human brain has uh, roughly 10 to the power of 11 neurons. Uh, elephant has twice as many because they have bigger brains, obviously. Uh, our neural networks are nowhere on this level, our neural networks are much smaller, even the deep learning ones. Uh, but we are still trying. So the core concept is to try to do something similar to what, what the brain does. And if you think about the very simple way of, of looking at 
what we understand about our brain, our brain consists of neurons. And a neuron is this kind of strange thing which is connected to some other neurons, and then it can be either active or not. So if you are trying to mathematically formulate this, uh, you would end up with, let's say, a circle like this, which has some inputs, x1, x2, xp. Those would be connections to other neurons or connections to input or output or senses actuators. There are different weights on those connections. And then the neuron itself will operate according to a particular nonlinear function. Turns out, if you only have linear functions and neurons, you cannot do much because then it, the whole thing becomes just a simple linear system. But if you put nonlinear function, you can, you can start getting some interesting results. So basically, the output of a neuron is just a function of weighted sum of its inputs. Conceptually, quite simple. So if we talk about the simple perceptron, let's try to use it for solving exactly the same problem as always before. We have binary classification problem. We want to classify something as uh, A or B, red or green, plus one or minus one for simplicity. Uh, so in this case, what we can use is we can use a sine function as our activation function. So we will have sine over vector of weights times vector of inputs. Uh, this can be any kind of, uh, of, a, of any size. And that means that we will get plus one or minus one depending on whether this sum inside will be bigger or smaller than zero. And so this is just a way of uh, going from a continuous set of inputs into plus one, minus one, so we have a clear uh, decision for our classification. Doesn't have to be binary decision, of course. We can do any other function here, but for simplicity, I will talk about binary ones. Uh, turns out that the actual uh, sine function is not that good if you use something like heavy side or, or whatever, uh, because it's not differentiable. So it's always zero or always minus one, and then it jumps suddenly. Sudden jumps are not great. So a much more common function to actually use in practice is something like the logistic function. There are some other examples as well. But the basic idea is that we want to avoid the jumps. And if we use a function with this roughly 0 for uh, values which are smaller than, uh, more than 0 and roughly 1 for values bigger with something in the middle which is not very uh, which is not very big, then it works just as well for the for the classification problem and makes it much easier to, to actually do calculations on. Uh, but the basic idea behind the perceptual learning, if we can go back to like the 60s and so on, is that we have some desired output. So we have a number of examples, as before, it could be uh, our visiting the restaurant thing, or it could be any of the examples that, that was shown based on SBM. Uh, so what we know is that for every example, we want to have either plus one or minus one, depending if this example belongs to class A or belongs to class B. Uh, and if we want to train our perceptron to actually recognize this, we can start with random settings. So we have random weights. We pick one of the examples from our training set. And if the classification of this example is correct, so if our neuron gives the same answer as we expect, then we don't need to do anything. If the classification is wrong, then what we do is we basically update the weights of this neuron so that it's more likely to give correct answer on this example in the future. Uh, and then if we can guarantee that doing this will eventually converge into something which gives correct decisions for all the, uh, all the examples, we are, we are great. Uh, 
because then we will keep doing this until we make no more errors, and then we have learned some kind of a function. So if you look at the, the equation here, you take the old weight and then you modify it basically based on the learning rate times the expected output times the corresponding input for this, for this weight. And the basic idea is that if you have made a mistake in your classification and your, your example should get plus one, but instead it got minus one, what you want to do is you want to lower the weights to make it more likely that this example will give you, uh, will give you minus one as an answer later on. So this is why you use this Fn in the equation, which basically means that if you want the final result to be lower, you need to lower the weights. If you want the final result to be bigger, you need to increase the weights. Uh, and then you also multiply this by the input value for this particular weight. And the idea here is that because the final result from your neuron depends on all the, all, all the inputs, however, it depends on those inputs to a different degree. But it also depends on the weights to a different degree. So in here, for example, if the final result of your the, the y value is too big, you want to lower all of the weights. But you also would like to know which of those weights contributed the most to the result. And if you think of it, the one that contributed the most was the one associated with the highest value of the input. In particular, if one of the inputs was zero, then you don't want to modify this weight because you don't know if this weight is, is too high or too low. So this is why you use the xin in here. You want to distribute the credit for this mistake according to how important each of the weights was. Uh, and here again, we are back to more uh, approximation. So basically, the idea behind perceptual learning is that this is a heuristic which is guaranteed to eventually converge to a solution which will never make any mistakes. But there is no guarantee that this will be the best solution for any, uh, for, for any particular quality criteria. Okay? So SVM is actually the only uh, of the popular algorithms which has those strong mathematical uh, foundations with a guarantee on actually finding the optimum solution. All the other algorithms are approximations. So if we look at, at an example of, uh, of how this could actually work, right? So we have our neuron. Let's say we have two inputs. We have x1 and x2, uh, two-dimensional input. We want to learn the end function. And so we have f, n function obviously is plus one if both inputs are true, and minus one in the opposite cases. Uh, we can start with the initial values of w, our initial weights being minus half, one, and one. We could pick them at random uh, or whatever. And we have our learning rate 0 0.3. Uh, so this is enough for us to start thinking about or to, to start actually learning this, uh, this perceptor. So if we think about it, all the knowledge that the perceptron has is actually encoded in the weights. So the weights that we have is the kind of current state of the perceptron. So what that means is that for those particular weights, the red line is the decision boundary for this perceptron. Right? Everything on the left-hand side will be classified as minus one. Everything on the right-hand side of this line will be classified as plus one. So what we can do is we can go through our training examples one by one and start looking at the, how, how does the, the perceptron do. So clearly what we want to do is we want to have this line move 
uh, towards uh, upper right. Uh, let's see if the perceptron can actually figure it out. So if we start with the first example here, this one is correctly classified. There is nothing we can do or nothing we have to do. Now we move to the next one. And now we notice that this one is actually not correctly classified, right? So now we have to do something. We have to modify the weights of the perceptron in order to make it more likely to be correctly classified. So if you remember the rule here, how we modify the weights, it's old value of the weights plus learning rate times expected value times the input. So here is what happens, right? We have W0 equal W0 minus mu times one. So it becomes minus 0 0.8. W1 becomes W1 minus mu times zero plus one, right? So as you can see here, we have three different weights. We have two inputs. The first weight is called the so-called bias. So this is the, this is using kind of a fake input, which is which is always one. Uh, I will not go into into too many details. But then this particular example has x one equal zero and x two equal one. So this is where this zero comes into the picture and this one comes into the picture. So we look at all three weights. We modify them according to our equation, and we end up with new weights. So now, after learning from this one example, our neuron has weights minus 0 0.8, 1, 0 0.7. Uh, luckily enough, in this case, it already classifies this example correctly. There is no guarantee that after a single update, the example will be classified correctly. It might be that we need to present it multiple times. But here, uh, I didn't want to make this, uh, this example too long. So after a single iteration, we are able to correctly classify this example. Right? As you can see, it, it makes sense. We have not, we have, we had neuron with this kind of decision boundary. We have found an example which was misclassified. So we have, we are changing this decision boundary and of moving it closer to the misclassified example, like this. Uh, and then we go to the next example. So. Here is third example. This one is correctly classified. There is nothing we need to do. Uh, and then we go to the last example. Again, incorrectly classified, so we need to do an update. Okay. So again, for every weight, we take the current value of the weight. Uh, we multiply it by the corresponding input learning rate, and we get new weights. So after this step, our neuron will look like this, minus 1.1, 0 0.7, 0 0.7. So this is the red line, which is now the decision boundary for this neuron. So everything to the left of this line will be classified as minus one. Everything on the right will be classified as plus one. Uh, and as you can see, this now correctly classifies all of our examples, so we don't need to be doing any more training. Uh, so that's a very, very simple way of, uh, of learning. You take a very simple unit like a perceptron, you do a very simple update based on a one example at a time. And the idea is that after a number of such steps, you will end up with the correct function. Uh, there are some nice things about uh, about perceptrons, but there are also some some problems. Uh, so actually, using this kind of uh, of learning, assuming your learning rate is low enough, you are guaranteed to find a solution in finite time if a solution exists. So if you have data which can be classified by a uh, by a perceptron, you will actually find the correct solution. Uh, the problem is this kind of learning is too simplistic to really generalize to more complicated networks. Uh, if you just look at a single, uh, single example at a time and you only 
modify the weights based on whether this, this specification was correct or not, it really doesn't work when you have bigger networks. And the problem is you need to have bigger networks because a single perceptron can only learn uh, linearly separable data. So we are again based to this, but back to this very, very simple case. Uh, and that, that's quite clear. You, you can see that the decision boundary for a single perceptron like this, this is just a line. If your data is not linearly separable, a perceptron will not be able to actually learn it. The main reason why we are, we are talking about perceptron and why uh, those kinds of approaches actually work is that we are not talking about the single perceptrons doing classification. We are talking about networks of perceptrons. So here, again, we had an example of the input of our neuron was the original training data, and the output of this neuron was the decision that we wanted to make. Uh, but when we think of how the brain is organized, most neurons are connected to other neurons, not to uh, muscles or, uh, or, or sensors or eyes or, or things like that. So the actual artificial neural networks are organized in terms of layers of such perceptrons or, or many perceptrons co connected to each other. Uh, and the problem with such a network is that you need to have more complicated way of learning it. So in this particular case, uh, for learning in uh, perceptron networks, we are using gradient descent. So the basic idea is, of course, to figure out what kind of error a network is making, find uh, or assume that this network, the, the, the function uh, captured by this network is differentiable, then we can calculate uh, gradient of this function. So then we can basically figure out how should we modify the weights so that the error decreases the fastest. Right? So I don't think I need to introduce the basic idea of, of gradient, uh, gradient descent, but the, the basic concept is, of course, to kind of always go downhill. If we have a measure of the error that the network is making, and the simple case is we can measure the error of the network just as a difference between the expected output and the output our network produces. So if we know this, this error, what we can do is we can calculate the gradient according, uh, or uh, we can calculate that the gradient, or how does the error change if we change different weights in the network, and we just go uh, towards the, the fastest dropping uh, error. Uh, and the whole idea here is that this actually allows us to combine several single layer perceptrons into a network which uh, together can learn functions which are a lot more complicated than just linear functions. Uh, so artificial neural network basically consists of a large number of interconnected perceptrons where each of them is making a linear decision, but together they all contribute to uh, much more complicated decisions. And there are several important aspects uh, in order to build those kinds of networks. One was, as, as we said, if we want to train them using gradient descent, it's important that we can actually differentiate uh, the, the total output of the network so that we know which weights we should be changing in order to reach the low error as soon as possible. Uh, the other 
part of it is that we want to be doing this learning in an iterative way by showing the network one example at a time and adapting the weights to this particular example. Just as we have shown it for the single perception, we can do exactly the same thing for the multi-layer perception. So if we take a what, what used to be the most common example until maybe 10 years ago or so, uh, was the artificial neural network with a single hidden layer. So just as, as you can see here in the picture, you would have some number of input neurons, where basically you would connect, uh, you would connect your input data, training data to those neurons. You would have a single hidden layer, and then you would have output layer, which captures the decision that you, you try to make. So for example, uh, for a binary decision, the output layer would consist of two neurons, one that would correspond to class A, the other one would correspond to class B. Uh, if you look at such a simple, uh, conceptually simple network structure, of course, you can have different numbers of, of neurons. So this, this is just a conceptual, uh, conceptual way of looking at it. You, you still need to decide how many neurons and different layers you want to have. But the, you, you can quite easily calculate the actual output of every neuron in this network uh, for different, different activation functions. And then what actually one can prove that you can approximate any kind of continuous function with a sufficiently large artificial neural network with a single hidden layer. So that's one of the reasons why people have focused on one layer networks for quite a bit of time. There is a mathematical proof that it's enough to approximate any kind of function. So why would you go into something more complicated? Training such networks was reasonably easy because it was easy to calculate the gradient. It was easy to uh, kind of figure out what was the contribution of different neurons to the solution and so on. Uh, and if you want to do something like this, you can see, again, I will not go into, into the map here, but what you want to be doing is you want to be able to compute the gradient of the error for different changes in the weights, right? This is just basic math. We want to figure out how does the output of the network changes given our input. If we have, if we choose the activation functions in a smart way, smart meaning something that will be easy to differentiate, we can quite easily calculate what is the, uh, what, what, what is the contribution of uh, a single weight to the final result so that we, we know how much we should be changing those weights, right? You can calculate what's the actual output of the network. Uh, here is the equation again for single hidden layer. We can differentiate that. We know what will be the effect of changing the weights. We can figure out for a particular learning rate that we want how much should we be changing those weights in order to reach the minimum as fast as possible. Again, in an approximate way, gradient descent is also a, a greedy algorithm. So this is the, the kind of core idea behind uh, artificial neural networks. We build a network of kind of collaborating neurons. Each neuron is very simple, but together they can approximate more complicated functions. We know how to change the weights in individual neurons in order to modify the final output. Uh, so this is again, just as a simple visualization of, of a gradient descent. Right? Depending on, on your point, you want to move in different directions, uh, the, the ways that will lead to fastest decrease of the error. Uh, 
And obviously, there is no guarantee that you will reach the global minimum using something like this. But the whole optimization problem here is way too complicated to actually find the, the optimal solution. So we need to uh, we need to focus on on approximations. Uh, there are other ways of of doing this, going beyond. May, may I ask a short question? Yeah, sure. Uh, can you go back uh, to page 22? 22. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you presented the mathematics behind this. Does this mathematics assume that the nodes in one layer, in the figure here we can see that one node in the layer to the left, mm -hmm. every node is connected to a layer in the next layer. Does the mathematics assume that this is the case? or, or, or is it different configuration? Let's say that it's not always connected to all the nodes in the next layer or not. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So this equation here assumes fully connected network. Uh, yeah. That's not that's not the only way of doing it, right? There, there are there are not, okay. not fully connected. Uh, I mean you can always the fully connected case is the most general one because you can always say that there is a connection, but the weight of this connection is zero, kind of like there wouldn't be a connection. Uh, in which case, you can always have exactly the same equations if you want. But uh, especially when you go to more complicated structures, you actually don't want to have a fully connected network. You want to have networks where uh, either the the weights, or either not all the all the neurons are connected, or not all the weights are different. Uh, so you, you could, for example, uh, you you have different ways of, of duplicating the weights across the layers and so on. So then the equations would change, right? So the, the equation is not not doesn't always look the same way. And the neurons, the number of neurons in each layer can also vary, so, so it's not always the same for, for all the layers either. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Is that the main thing that differs from different uh, networks, the, the number of the nodes and how they are connected, or are there other things that differ from the different algorithms? So n number of neurons is, is not really that, that crucial. It's, it's more about the connections. Because the, the, mm -hmm. the problem with, with a network even network like this is that you have a lot of connections, right? Uh, which means that the number of connections corresponds to the number of weights that you have in, in your network. And the number of weights corresponds to the uh, complexity of the hypothesis. Basically, just as the more nodes you had in your decision tree, the more complicated the decision tree was and the more likely you were to overfeed. We have exactly the same problem with neural network. The more weights you have in your neural network, the more complex your hypothesis because every change in the weight means a change in the hypothesis. So the more weights you have, the more likely you are to overfeed. Uh, so a lot of what neural what deep learning was about was about finding good structures for the network where you can actually have more neurons without adding more weights. That, that's a kind of short explanation. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, again, when the original idea behind the learn, behind the training neural network was this simple gradient descent. There are more clever ways of doing it. One example is uh, resilient propagation, where you actually modify the learning rate depending on how your training is going. Because one of the biggest problems with uh, gradient descent algorithms is that uh, figuring out a good learning rate is tricky because if you pick your learning rate too slow, you will never really good, reach good solution because you, you will be changing things too slowly. If you pick your learning rate 
too big, you are likely to jump over good solutions uh, and you will basically end up doing some kind of random search instead of, of guided search. Uh, so resilient propagation is one way of actually updating the learning rate based on the results you are getting. So the idea here is that uh, if as you are doing your, uh, your propagation or as, as, as you are uh, doing your gradient descent, if you keep going in the same direction, then you want to increase the learning rate. You basically, if you are always going in the same direction, you want to go faster. But if you change direction, if that means that, well, something has happened in between my previous iteration and this one, which means that I've actually jumped over something interesting. Uh, and that means that you should decrease your learning rate so that you focus more on this interesting area. And again, this, this is uh, a little bit more mathematical. It, it's just an example of how you can play with the, the idea of, uh, of finding the minimum. But the goal in both cases is, is exactly the same. Right? You want to find the set of weights in the network which minimizes the error that the network makes. Uh, and here is also one interesting example of uh, uh, how you can think about the, the uh, overfitting problem because uh, neural networks are different from both decision trees and SVMs because they are examples of uh, online learning. So you basically learn one example and you can reuse your examples, but still, you present an example to a network, you get an update of the rule of, of the weights, you now have a different model. You present another example, get an update, you get yet another model, and so on. So basically, in a neural network, this is called training epochs, but that means that you keep getting better and better. Uh, models pretty much continuously. If you look at SVMs, there is just a single optimization problem. You present all the data to SVM and you get an answer that there is no, no iterative process. If you look at decision trees, there is a little bit of iteration, but not that much because basically at every step you create one node in your network. Uh, or one node in your, in your decision tree. But there, there is not that many of those steps. And it doesn't really make that much sense to kind of track the accuracy at, at different levels. Because every, uh, at every step, you look at the, uh, you look at all the data anyway. The neural network training is quite a bit different because you present examples one after another, which actually means that you can be tracking pretty much continuously how does the classification error look like. And then you can see uh, what, what is shown here on this plot, that as you train more and more, the training error, the red line, will continuously decrease. So the error you are making on a training data set will get smaller and smaller. But at some point, the validation error, so the error that you are getting on the test set, will start increasing. And this is very clear visualization of the overheating problem. At the beginning, once your network doesn't know all that much, it just learns. It, it learns the kind of true properties of the data gets better with every, every learning step. But at some point, it actually stops learning the true interesting knowledge, and it just starts to learn the specifics of this particular training set. It, it starts to adapt to the error, uh, to, to the noise in the data, and so on. And that's the moment where you want to stop uh, your training and say, there is no point in training 
anymore because it will actually do more harm than good. So in many cases, you actually want to do something like this in order to decide when the network has learned enough, you want to set out a validation set in order to continuously uh, estimate the test error in order to know when to stop training. I mean, it's possible to say that you will train for a given amount of time or given number of training epochs uh, or until the gradient change becomes too small. But what you really want to be doing is, is you want to be finding this sweet spot of when the validation error is, is actually the lowest. Uh, and then one more thing which is, which is related to that which I actually haven't talked about before is uh, if you want to know at what point the validation error is actually the lowest, uh, what you need to do is you need to find a way of comparing models. And this is a little bit tricky because uh, what we are working with here is uh, pretty much probabilistic or, or random variables. Uh, so if you have two models, let's say model A and model B, uh, you don't really, you, you kind of never really know the actual expected classification error that those models will make. What you can do is you can uh, test this model many times and you will get some kind of uh, random results which depend on the actual true classification error. And so this will be realizations of random variable because depending on what kind of data you present to your model, you might get better or worse results kind of at random. So what you will actually end up with is some kind of distribution of classification errors based on cross-validation or any other way in which you are actually measuring this. Uh, and then what you can do is you can do, for example, this kind of error bar, bar plot where you say the average accuracy of model A is, let's say, 80%. The average accuracy of model B is maybe 50%. But there is some kind of confidence interval or error bar on top of that based on how widespread the different uh, numbers have been. Uh, and this is in particular important when you are doing uh, artificial neural networks because of how many different uh, parameters you have when you, uh, when you decide on the neural network. Right? Even if we assume that we, we want to pick uh, the simple case with one hidden layer network, there is still a number of parameters that we need to determine. We need to figure out how many nodes in this hidden network. We need to figure out which input data to use. Uh, we need to figure out what kind of preprocessing is better and so on. So what we can do is we can create a lot of different models based on the same principles of artificial neural networks. And then what we want to do is we want to know which of those models is actually the best. And one way of doing it is to do cross-validation, compare those different models, and then do a plot like this, where, where we show uh, there is some difference between the two models. But then we can start asking question of, is it, is it statistically significant? So can we really trust that this difference is inherent in those models, or is it just random? Uh, um, but by chance, one of the models happens to be luckier than the other and gives us slightly better results. So those concepts are obviously not, not specific to artificial neural networks. But again, they, they are more important here because you can easily create so many different, uh, different neural network models. So now, if I go briefly in, in the direction of, of deep learning. Deep learning as, as a concept is quite, or probably too complicated to, to cover in, in a course like this. So we will not go into, into actual details, but we will just 
give a, an overview of what is what is why is it so important. So the the core concept behind deep learning is that they do what can be called representation learning. So instead of requiring experts to come up with good features, they can create hierarchical features in an automatic way. Uh, and after the SVM lecture, you should know why representations are so important, because the kernel does nothing more but just change the representation. But here is yet another example. If we have data as on the left plot, we have some blue points and some green points in this kind of coordinate space, it's difficult to learn a good, uh, good classifier. Right? It's not necessarily very obvious how to separate those. If we try to learn decision tree, it will probably make quite a bit of, of error on this data. But if we transform this data into polar coordinates, we will end up with the data on the right-hand side plot. And if we try to create decision tree now, it becomes trivial. This will be just a single node which perfectly separates this data. And so again, this, this is something that you could do with SVMs and kernel, but this is also something that uh, kind of underlies the most important parts of, of deep learning. So the, the core idea behind deep learning is this kind of repeated composition. So you would start with some kind of data. And here I will use images because it's uh, one of the most successful areas for, for deep learning. So you start with the input data in terms of pixels. And as we have talked about, uh, pixels have actually very, very little information. Right? And a single pixel doesn't really tell you much about the image. Uh, there is a lot of noise in the pictures, uh, in, in the actual values of, of pixels, and so on. So this input layer actually has a lot of noise and not that much useful information. So what deep learning will do is at different layers going kind of upwards here, it will start building up features which are useful for actually doing the, uh, the task. So in this case, object identification. So maybe in the first layer, it will start detecting edges. Right? So you could see different kinds of, uh, uh, of edges that this it detects. Then based on those edges, in the next layer, it will start detecting things like corners or contours of objects, and so on. In the next layer, based on those, it will start detecting parts of objects. So it could detect a face, or it could detect uh, a wheel of a car, and so on. And th then finally, after some number of layers, it will be able to identify, let's say, car, person, or animal. Uh, and the point here is that uh, here what the network is actually building this is building hierarchical representations so those edges that the same feature called let's say edge is useful for detecting many different contours and corners so it's kind of reusing the knowledge about edges at different places of the image that's, that's kind of the core idea behind it. And until deep learning came into the picture, we didn't really have a good way of building those kind of hierarchical features. So a lot of this work was done by, by people, by experts, by researchers. So we had a number of different ways of extracting features from images that came as a result of kind of years of research. Uh, and then it turned out that you can do those kinds of things automatically in a actually better way. Mm. Again, the, the problem with those kinds of approaches is you need a lot of data for, for doing this. Mm -hmm. Yes? Are the features uh, that you talk about here, are they uh, something that the, the human eye can, can uh, Percept so can can you actually get something if visually if you look at the uh, different layers? 
in this kind of image recognition algorithm? Yes, in some cases you can, not always. There, there, there are some, so there is two, two aspects to it. One is, is the network actually learning features that make sense to us? And the answer to this is yes and no. So some of the features that the networks extract are meaningful, and some of the features we haven't really been able to understand. So, so it learns some things which don't, don't seem useful for us. And we actually, again, don't know if this is good or bad. So if we should learn something from the network, meaning those features actually are useful, or if we should improve our network so to not learn those features because they are not useful. We, we don't know that yet. Mm -hmm. The other okay. side is also how do, we, how do we know what the network has left? So there is a lot of research in visualizing those middle layers in the networks. So we have some ways of doing it, but again, we are not yet uh, perfect at it. There, there, there is still different, way, different information that the network has learned, which we don't have a good way of, of visualizing. Mm. Mm -hmm. So if we think about what, what deep neural network is, uh, we've talked about simple networks, like a single neuron, and do logistic regression. If we have one hidden layer, we can start talking about, okay, now we can learn any kind of function. Uh, deep neural networks is just about, let's add more layers. And the main question is, of course, why, why would we? Because we want to do those hierarchical features. And as we've said, you can learn any kind of function with just single hidden layer. The problem is you cannot do it with a small network. So again, you can, if there are mathematical proofs that you can have a small deep neural network, which is, which learns a particular function. And we know that it's possible to learn the same function with much shallower network. But that shallow network would need exponentially more hidden units. So basically, you are saving a lot by having this kind of deep neural network structure. Uh, the problem here is that the network structure needs to be well adapted to the structure of the function. So here is an example with XOR functions uh, where you need a particular network structure to learn it efficiently. But the challenge is, if we don't know the function that we are trying to learn, and if we knew it, we wouldn't be learning it, uh, how do we come up with good network structures which can learn a lot of useful uh, functions? So that, that's where most of the, uh, of the research in deep learning actually is. Coming up with new network architectures which are we expect or empirically prove are good for different types of uh, functions that we find interesting. Uh, and just to kind of show you a little bit about what what the kind of hype that that we are having with uh, deep learning today. Uh, so this is the number of people registered for. NIPS conference. This is one of the main uh, uh, main uh, deep learning conferences. So between 2002 and 2016, th there was some increase in the number of people registered. Uh, but things have changed quite a bit in 2017. Right? I mean that this this line. I don't know if you can see my mouse cursor, but this line looks nothing like the lines before. So something significant has changed. Uh, that's obviously not, not only about uh, deep learning, because if, if you look at the, uh, so, so here is an example from Stanford, people who are registered for their AI course. Uh, 150 students, 2015, 350, 16, 750 in 
2017. So basically, every year, the number of students doubles. So apparently in 24 years, everybody on Earth will be enrolled in this the Stanford course. We have some time left, but not, not very much. But of course, the, the main reason why this kind of hype happened is that those kinds of networks actually work. And interestingly enough, they work on the type of challenge which is very easy to understand because they work on images. And until recently, people have been very proud of, of our ability to understand images. Uh, there was basically no way computers were even approaching human levels of competence in, in understanding images. Uh, but this has changed. That, that's, that's actually the, the biggest change that, uh, that neural networks have, have brought into the picture, deep learning has brought into the picture. On simple tasks like recognizing objects and images and so on, actually neural, deep neural networks now outperform humans. They, they are better than, than humans. Uh, and most of this work is focused, as I said, on building good architectures. So the kind of starting point of, of this was convolutional neural networks. So this is a type of a network which has a very strict architecture, looking at where, where the connections are not to all the neurons in the pre previous layer, but only to a very small region in the previous layer. So for every region in one layer, you will have a single neuron in the next layer, which kind of combines the information from this region. Uh, and the idea itself is not necessarily new. I mean, it goes back to 70s, 80s. What has happened is basically two things. We've gotten a lot more efficient computers. Actually, there are three things, because we've gotten more efficient computers we have gotten a lot more data. The, the kind of performance that we can get today are, wouldn't be possible even five years ago, mainly because we didn't have that much data. Uh, and also, there have been some changes in the, in the actual learning and architectures. So that today's architectures are not exactly the same as the ones from 79. They, they have the same, they are based on the same concepts, but the actual architectures are different. So the basic idea is the conversion neural network, and then there have been a number of modifications to it. So one popular was, was AlexNet in 2012, uh, quite uh, based on similar concepts, but, but a different architecture. Uh, the core, reason for why deep learning actually works is regularization. So if you think of it, you have something like 1.2 million examples. But in the network of AlexNet size, you have between 5 and 100 million parameters. So if you go back to, what, to, to the lecture about SVMs, uh, the idea there was that you can bound the expected error by number of parameters divided by number of training examples. If you look at it here, you have 100 times as many parameters as examples, which means that your error would, you, you would only make error. That would be only uh, over, uh, over training. So the main idea behind deep learning is to actually build this kind of architecture, but then limit the number of active parameters as much as possible. And I will not go into details, but there is a lot of work on, on doing that. Uh, I will skip the slide about adversarial. I just want to show some pretty pictures. Uh, here is an example of how you can visualize the kind of things that the network learns. Right? So here you can see uh, in some level of abstraction what kind of features the network is actually learning for different kind of concepts. Uh, so that was for convolutional neural network. Here is for a different kind of network called PDG. 
So that's that's what I wanted to talk about today. Any final questions, comments? Uh, yeah, I have one uh, about the data transformation because we we've touched on it uh, a couple of times. Um, and I was thinking if if uh, it's it can be used as a part of maybe a feature creation uh, step uh, to actually get data into some form, some format where it fits better to the algorithm you're going to use. Mm -hmm. If that is maybe a way to get more accuracy or something. Yes, that's definitely a way of of getting more accuracy. Uh, so if you can come up with better features, you can improve things a lot. And of course. The ultimate end of it is you just want to have one feature which will tell you to which class your example should belong, right? Uh, and then mm -hmm. learning becomes really, really easy. The, the tricky part is, of course, finding the right balance between how much work you as, a, as an expert want to put into this versus how much work machine learning algorithms can handle. Uh, that balance is not, not easy. Mm. Should should uh, is there like a bunch of uh, common um, transformations that that can be used, or is it more of uh, is it is it a question of looking at data and then thinking uh, about like more of an intuition thing? So it it depends how unique your data is. So if there is a whole bunch of of typical features, and it can go from anything like Fourier transform is is a way of transforming data, uh, that's popular. Uh, it can be, for example, if you look with vibration data, as was mentioned, that there is a whole bunch of, of papers about here are good features to extract from vibration data. Uh, if you look at images, there is a whole bunch of features. If you look at speech, there is a whole bunch of features. Uh, if you talk about, so basically the, the idea is if you can find some other examples of other people who have used data which is similar to yours, you can you can figure out or you can see what kind of features they have used. Uh, in general, that's that's harder. Like if, if you say, well, I have data which is different than what anybody has ever used, then you probably need to come up with your own features. Okay, yeah, makes sense. Okay, great. Thank you very much for today, then. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Do we have time now? Yeah. So one of the guys left? Or?